Welcome to Why Knowledge Matters. In this episode, Professor Emeritus Wernoy Valdredakov joins me to discuss Desmond Tutu's legacy and how he shaped his life and work and joy. Welcome back, Wern. It's such a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure for me too, Yannick. I think what you're doing with all of these interviews with a variety of people is uh, really um, a good thing in terms of getting ideas out there and getting people to engage with one another. And I think the respectful way in which you go about engaging people uh, is itself uh, commendable and is in line with uh, our today's topic. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for your words, Wern. This really means means a lot to me. And today, really, uh, this is really to honor a, a legacy and someone who also is dear to you. And uh, this is uh, Desmond Tutu, who just passed away recently on December 26th in, uh, in age of uh, 90. And please give us some ideas, you know, on... In other words, describe to us the person Desmond Tutu was, especially to you. Mm -hmm. I think that, that we have to think about uh, Desmond Tutu's life in, in, a, in a few phases. Um, the beginning part uh, of his real engagement that brought him into the consciousness of the world was in the struggle against apartheid. And here he, he combined this positive spirit with a, a keen, incisive understanding of the injustices and didn't hesitate at all to speak boldly uh, about what was going on in, in the apartheid regime of South Africa. And he called upon people in the world to support the struggle. He called on people to uh, boycott uh, South Africa, even though it might provide, uh, the implications of that might be some difficulties for some of the people in South Africa. But he desperately wanted to see uh, the whole apartheid system uh, addressed and done away with. And uh, he wanted the world to be engaged in that in that struggle, if you like. And then uh, there was a decisive moment when everything changed, uh, and that had to do with uh, Nelson Mandela being released and then the events that then led to uh, the dismantling of the uh, apartheid regime and of granting freedom to everybody to vote, and that led necessarily then to the... Uh, the election of Nelson Mandela, uh, and he was the one that presented or introduced uh, Nelson Mandela. He was the frame, if you like, for the picture of, of Nelson Mandela. And there was this sense of complete solidarity between him and Mandela. And that was sort of the transition then into this other phase of his life that, that again, brought him into the world consciousness and this phase had to do with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, his leadership of that, and his developing then a theology of Ubuntu, a theology of reconciliation, a theology of forgiveness. Uh, and so his writings and teachings around all of these things uh, be, proved to be um, really, really important. And then I think the last phase of his life, which I'll say um, more about later, has to do with his um, embracing of a spirit of joy. And, and this came out in this book, um, the Book of Joy, that he did together with uh, the Dalai Lama. And uh, this element of joy was there uh, throughout. You can always, the, there are so many pictures of him uh, laughing and having this infectious smile. And I think the, the, the idea of, of, a, of an empowering spirituality that, that leads to a fountain of joy is one thing that was there throughout and, and in the struggle 
part of his period, it, it was the empowering part that gave him the, the energy to continue with the struggle and in the phase that had to do with truth and reconciliation and listening to the stories of victims, uh, it was this positive spirit that enabled him to have the, the strength to, to deeply enter into the lives of the victims. And then in his, his later reflections and engagement uh, gave him a, a chance to reflect on, on what was perhaps most central to his uh, spiritual life. What is so uh, fascinating when we think we always, to some extent, take it for granted and we think, well, South Africa, this was a special case, but it could have turned so bloody because, I mean, the black population obviously, obviously is much bigger than the white population and that everything, you know, translated so smoothly is almost a miracle. So to what extent would you attribute this to a person? Of course, he had also other person who helped him. That's very important. And Nelson Mandela and so on. But can you just elaborate a little bit on how important it might have been in this case to have a personality and a human being like Desmond Tutu, you know, in charge of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but also previously his uh, fight for justice uh, uh, during the apartheid system. Yeah, and what you're saying about how it could have been so different comes through in a in a relationship I had with David Chanyani, with whom I studied in a. Uh, seminary in California. And David Chanyani's story is that he had been part of the African National Congress. At a certain point, he got tired of killing people. And um, he was an embittered individual in, um, in Congo. And he was standing uh, on the street kind of uh, disappointed that he couldn't meet somebody. And this uh, black woman from the United States gave him a, a gospel of John and he was angry about it. He eventually read it. Long and short of it is he, he turned his life around and decided he didn't want to kill anymore and uh, came to you to Canada and then to the United States. And, um, uh, and when he was in the United St States, uh, the, the people of the African National Congress came to him and said, well, after the civil war, it wasn't if there's going to be a civil war, they were saying, after the civil war, could you be part of our negotiating team because we'd like a peace-oriented person to be part of our team at that point. And I think this mentality in the 1980s, this expectation that there would for sure be a, an absolute bloodbath and a, a, a brutal civil war uh, was was a, there, there was a sense that that was the trajectory of South Africa. So when you say things have go, could have gone so differently, that was the likely thing that could have happened. And I think the, the strength of leadership of people like uh, Desmond Tutu, who, who worked in the civil society and church and uh, in the arena of public protest and mobilizing people to fight against the injustice and to do so in a nonviolent way played an important role. And then his leadership at the time of the transition and his empowering role for the tremendous work of Nelson Mandela, who when he left uh, Robben Island and then as he prepared for the new reality um, what set him apart really was his willingness to, um, first of all, engage the other. When Nelson Mandela was on Robben Island, he made friends with the, the jailers. Uh, he, he read uh, Afrikaner novels and, and engaged in a, uh, an indwelling of the Afrikaner reality. Uh, and so he was able to do symbolic things that showed that his heart was big enough to include uh, white South Africans in the new regime. And, and this be, was really a, a critical part of what happened. And, and it was like 
Mand Mandela was living and acting this work of, of forgiveness, which was so consistent with what uh, Desmond Tutu was both saying and enacting himself. And it shows the power of leaders who have this new kind of vision uh, to really make a difference in a situation that could have become so violent uh, and would have included a, a, a terrific, a terrifying bloodbath, if you like. For what do you remember Desmond Tutu most? I think uh, his uh, graciousness, his willingness to be open to anybody, his sense of reality, because he was even willing to name his own vulnerability to try to seek attention and have a mimetic desire, say, for uh, a lot of uh, recognition. You have to listen very carefully to hear this in him, but he had this, this self-awareness. It's not like he put himself on a pedestal and said, well, I'm above all of that. Um, he knew himself well enough to know that, that there's, there are things about that that he appreciated, and yet he was able to not let that be the driving force behind what he did. He was, did not do what he did to get attention for himself. It came out of this really deep humanity. And I think it was him living out uh, what he was talking about. And there's a quote in this book here, Recon Reconciliation, Restoring Justice uh, by Don the Gucci, um, that, that indicates this aspect of them. So I'll just read this little quote because it, it, it emphasizes this dimension. Um, there's a remarkable story to be told of men and women, as well as communities of faith who have opened up a path to reconciliation and left us a legacy of actions that provides signposts of what reconciliation means. Their actions undoubtedly speak louder than words but words rightly chosen have their own power. Reconciliation is something that occurs through the interplay of speech, listening and action motivated by hope and love. The way, and this is emphasized here in italics, the way in which we speak with and listen to the alienated other is already an action that makes reconciliation a possibility. Desmond Tutu demonstrated this connection vividly, which is why his account of the TRC, of which he was, the, was chair entitled, No Future Without Forgiveness, carries weight, transforming traditional words into something fresh and revolutionary. Even those who may challenge his interpretation of events, reject his faith claims, and remain skeptical of his optimism, cannot deny the integrity of his witness born out of the struggle for justice sustained by a profound spirituality. So, you know, it was the way in which he listened um, and the way in which he made himself vulnerable and the way he allowed himself to express uh, his emotions that, um, that sort of uh, set him apart. Desmond Tutu also wrote the foreword to your book from violence to blessings. How did you come to know Desmond Tutu? Well, I, I had heard him, I think in the 1980s when he came on a speaking tour in Canada, but I didn't meet him at that time. And um, I guess what I, I could say leading up to that is that there's this idea of Ubuntu. And I have here this, this African carving. And if you look closely at it, it shows the, the interconnectedness of people because you have one person and, and, and there are people that are, have these different burdens and they're, they're helping one another with, uh, with these burdens and they're resting on one another. So they're all connected. Um, and so one helps me with my burden and I help the next person, maybe another person uh, with their burden. 
and so um, in keeping with this concept of, of interconnectedness, um, um, I thought it would be really good to have Desmond Tutu write the foreword. And, and I had been called in a special way um, to engage with uh, the Canadian Armed Forces and particularly military chaplaincy. Uh, this is quite something for me because I come from a back, background of, of uh, pacifism and, and, uh, and my, my father, for instance, was a conscientious objector during the, the Second World War. And, and so connections with the military was not something that came natural to me. For, for me, that was a world that was entirely other for me. Uh, but I got this call from Tim Maine Donald, who was a military chaplain, uh, who wanted to talk to me about reconciliation, and we developed a, a really good friendship. Tim Maine Donald then became chaplain general of the Canadian Armed Forces, and he engaged me then to lead a retreat with all of the uh, chaplains to further the ideas of, of reconciliation in a the theater of war which was his, uh, his vision. Uh, it turns out that Tim Maine Donald became good friends of the uh, Chaplain General of the South African Armed Forces. All of this was um, taking place uh, in the late nineties and into the early 2000s. Uh, my book came out in 2002. So that gives you a sense of this. And as I talked with Tim Maine Donald about this, he said, well, why don't you send me the manuscript and I'll pass it on to my buddy who is the Chaplain General of the South African Forces. He is a friend of uh, Desmond Tutu. And maybe if he asks uh, to have this forward written, uh, it might get somewhere. So that's what we did. And uh, time went by and each time I wanted to find out how things were with regard to this forward, I'd call Tim Maine Donald's office and his staff would contact the uh, office of the Chaplain General in South Africa and they would make contact with Desmond Tutu. At a certain point, I said, you know, this is a little cumbersome. Why don't you just give me the coordinates of, of the staff of, um, of Desmond Tutu and, and I can contact them directly. Uh, and I got these messages back. Uh, Nelson De Man or Desmond Tutu has not said yes, but he hasn't said no. <laughs> and that continued to give me hope. And finally, I got the word that said um, he will do it, but he wanted me to ghostwrite a forward so that he wouldn't have to start from scratch. So what I did is I got seven books out of the library at St. Paul University, and I really got into the world of Desmond Tutu. And I wrote the foreword uh, that he would sign off on. I drafted it, uh, which he did. And, and he made some changes, which indicates that he really looked at this carefully and he owned what was written. Uh, so coming out of that indwelling of his word, word here we have this, this twofold thing, which shows the, um, this a matter of, it enacts this matter of Ubuntu, that our lives are intertwined. And, and if we listen carefully, we can get into the world of one another and we can give affirmation. And so his engagement with me was empowering. It certainly helped to get people to take my book seriously, to have him write the foreword. But at the same time, our lives were intertwined in that I engaged his life and he was willing to uh, embrace, foster um, this. So with that in mind, I'll read you uh, some parts of the foreword that show this coming together of worlds. Um, so this is the beginning. Throughout my life, I have come to know violence well, not only in my native South Africa, where oppressive laws and brutal practices scarred generations, but also in Jerusalem, Addis Ababa, Biafra, and Belfast, I have felt the imminence of violence in the air. What Vern Neufeld Redekops describes in this book as violence I have known about in all its forms, 
Now he brings to the table of those wishing to diminish the power of violence in this world, a conceptual framework that helps us to name with greater precision the dynamics of hurtful actions, policies, and impulses. Nor am I a stranger to blessing as the result of reconciliation processes. Blessing, as Redekup uses the word, has a close family resemblance to the concept of Ubuntu, which guided many of us through the taxing days of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Ubuntu speaks of the essence of being human. It in includes qualities of generosity, hospitality, friendliness, caring, and compassion. It expresses the fact that humanity is shared and that through our human connectedness, we find our identities. People with Ubuntu feel good about the well-being and success of others. There is a reciprocal mimetic quality to Ubuntu and that the Ubuntu of one is replicated in another, which in turn adds to the Ubuntu of the first. There is a communal aspect to Ubuntu and that it contributes to social good. When Redekup introduces the idea of a mimetic structure of blessing infusing a relational system, he is in effect talking about the increase of Ubuntu within a community. All this is to say that good theory helps us better understand and, community and communicate key aspects of our own worldview. And then he says particular aspects of this book resonate with the South African experience. Anger, revenge, hatred, and, and aggressive competitiveness cannot destroy Ubuntu. These words show the link between emotions and violence. As I chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, the most painful and agonizing emotions were powerful, powerfully expressed as people talked of the effect of torture, rape, and killing. To Redekup's credit, he does not shy away from the emotional dimensions of violence. In fact, the pages that follow help us see the links at both the biological and experiential levels. So um, not only did um, Desmond Tutu write that forward, he also spoke at the book release. And, and this was uh, to the credit of my editor, Kevin Burns, who had formerly worked at CBC Radio. And uh, so Kevin Burns worked it out with Tutu uh, on the, at the time of the um, book launch that Tutu would uh, record a message that we could then play at the book launch. Um, and so um, Tutu was in Florida at the time uh, speaking there at a conference and they had a time perfectly at exactly at a given time, Kevin would phone him and he would read into um, the telephone his message for our book launch, uh, which he did. Um, and we had a picture of him up as we played, played the words at the book launch. Uh, not only did Tutu write the foreword for uh, From Violence to Blessing, but he also were, wrote the, the foreword to uh, another book, which I wrote together with Shirley Hooray, which is Beyond Control, A Mutual Respect Approach to Protest Crowd Police Relations. And you can see there foreword by Desmond Tutu. And um, I had the advantage at the time when this book was being written of, of working with Sarah Storm, who had, uh, was a student of mine in the master's program and uh, who had uh, spent time in South Africa. And so she gave me some additional background that I could use because again, I had to uh, ghost write the foreword. And again, he went through it and gave his affirmation to it. So I'll just uh, read the beginning part of this. Dissent, marches, protest, violence, public order policing, repression. I have wished, witnessed all of these. Protests called Toyi Toyi in South Africa have been important, not only in ending apartheid, but also for the emergence of full democracy and the development of South African culture today. These phenomena raise important questions about the dynamics of a democratic uh, society. Foundational to how I make sense of such phenomena are the twin lenses of Ubuntu and reconciliation. 
Um, what is refreshing about Beyond Control is the vision for the kind of society in which protesters and police recognize their mutual humanity, as well as how both are needed for a democratic society to function well. This is Ubuntu applied to a contentious aspect of community life. Police and protesters are indeed connected. Governments as targets of protest, bystanders who watch, and media who cover these events are all part of a web of relational systems centered on protest crowd uh, activities. On, in the mutual respect paradigm and case study of the seminars in Ottawa, there are promises of the possibility of reconciliation in the, in the wake of mutual hurt. There is something magical in face-to-face -face encounters that take place in a safe environment. I saw this again and again during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Those who lost loved ones at the hands of repressive police could open their hearts to forgiveness of the very people who had hurt them profoundly. Not that there is a formula, nor that it happens easily, but seeing the humanity and the heartfelt witness of the other has a profound impact. Protesters and police who have confronted one another through the violent actions of batons, tear gas, rocks, and Molotov cocktails have their own truths of how they experience the event. When Redekop and Perret recount the story of protesters who suffered tear gas at the Quebec summit of the Americas and exchanged their truths with those police who launched the tear gas, I can well imagine the redeeming impact of their mutual insights into the lives of each other. And so again, uh, there's this coming together of Tutu's uh, profound understandings and his, his willingness to publicly, through the foreword of this book, uh, show the interconnections between that and the concepts that were developed. And you can see a certain resonance then in the work that I was doing with protesters and police and the spirit in which I was doing that and how it resonated with uh, what Desmond Tutu stood for and what he had been working on. So, he undoubtedly um, influenced your life and work. Is this uh, fair to say? Oh, yes, really, really definitely. And I think it, um, it reinforced aspects of uh, my own growth and trajectory and uh, included, I think at the heart of that is this, this sense that our lives are really caught up with one another and who we are is really um, uh, connected to, to those around us. And that, that the best in this is that when my well being is closely tied to the well being of the other, so that I delight, I feel stronger, I feel growth, I feel a sense of joy as I see someone else flourish. And I think that that what he uh, what he does, he not only recounts the traditional teachings of Ubuntu that come out of his uh, African roots, but by living them as he did, by living these concepts and by thinking and reflecting about them, he made them come alive in a new way. And and you could sort of see the same pattern in, in Jesus, his Aramaic name was Yeshua. What Yeshua did is he reflected on the Torah and brought forward the essence of the Torah in a new way. And he, and he, he lived it and taught it in a new way that opened up new possibilities. And, and in a sense, that's sort of what Tudor was doing with this uh, uh, concept of Ubuntu. And that very concept of being delighted in the well-being of the other flies in the face of the self-interested uh, meme, if you like, that has infused Western culture. So our economic system is based on self-interest. Uh, we have to do things for ourselves uh, and get ourselves and our own group ahead at the expense of others. And in international relations and in politics, we've had this idea of self-interest, you do everything 
to make you and your own group as important as possible. And Ubuntu is just the opposite of this. It says the essence of who we are as humanity and what brings us joy and satisfaction and growth and wholeness and actualization is much more in the uh, embrace of the other and in the uh, delight in seeing um, others prosper, heal, and uh, move ahead. Um, concept that I develop as, as uh, mimetic structures of blessing. And I think for any of these, these key concepts, it's really good to look at them from different perspectives and with different theoretical frameworks and, and, and what came through in the, in the forward, um, which, which Desmond Tutu acknowledged and embraced was that uh, my concept of mimetic structures of blessing is really just another way of looking at what he was developing with his uh, concept and theology of Ubuntu. Your last words to Desmond Tutu. Oh, my last words to him, I guess would be uh, profound gratitude uh, for what he did for the world and what he did for me personally. And I think uh, a sense of uh, gratitude. Thank you, Desmond Tutu, for your life, how you lived it, how you expressed it. Um, I think that's the first and, and uh, most important thing, a, a profound gratitude. And then uh, to pull out of all of that, um, his expression of joy. And uh, again, I'll, I'll look at this um, book of joy, uh, which came out of his engagement with the Dalai Lama. Um, and I'll just read one paragraph from here. Still, uh, some might wonder what our own joy has to do with, the, with countering injustice and equality and inequality. What does our happiness have to do with addressing the suffering of the world? In short, the more we heal our own pain, the more we can turn to the pain of others. But in a surprising way, what the Archbishop and the Dalai Lama were saying is that the way we heal our own pain is actually by turning to the pain of others. It's a virtuous cycle. The more we turn toward others, the more joy we experience. And the more joy we experience, the more we can bring joy to others. The goal is not just to create joy for ourselves, but as the Archbishop poetically phrased it, to be a reservoir of joy, an oasis of peace, a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around you. And as we will see, joy is in fact quite contagious, as is love, compassion, and generosity. And I think, uh, so this expression of, of um, um, gratitude is an expression for that, that joy that he radiated, uh, that has a contagious aspect. Uh, and if we start feeling sorry for ourselves, we just have to think of Desmond Tutu and his big smile and how he laughed and how he was prepared to uh, maintain this positive spirit even as he was confronting uh, injustices. Vern, thank you so much for your profound, as always, reflections. And I look very much forward to have you back soon, Vern. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you for making uh, this possible. And I myself have benefited through my uh, preparation for this. And so again, it's a mimetic structure of blessing that occurs right now um, as we uh, mutually contribute to each other's uh, well-being. Thank you so much, Wern Neufeld Redekopp.